It's Monday, that means extra time, and I am drinking from my poison chalice because, boys, Toronto FC are back, but Alejandro Pozuelo Kalen is not the best player in MLS. No, Memo Rodriguez. Huh? No, Carlos <laughs> Vela. No, Zlatan, who Matt Doyle, on behalf of Bobby Warshaw, is going to try and convince you the Galaxy are better off without Zlatan. Says he's not a troll. Matt Doyle, not the hot take king, though. Peter Vermees says Monterey, the best team he's ever coached against in his 11 years. And not the only Peter on the show. We get to the origins of CCL fever. Extra time starts right now. Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS Studios in Midtown Manhattan. I am Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, David Goss, Kaylin Carr, big show today, Peter Vermees, CCL Fever, both the strategy behind the semifinals against Monterey and the origin story of the illness. We will find out from box to box. Pete Brownell, the man who coined this term, where it came from. You've wondered for five years. Now you're about to find out. Do you feel it, guys? Do you feel the anticipation? Are you ready? Do you already know the story? Were you in the Opta offices, Doyle? Or I would No, I was not in the Opta offices, but I've... I've had the CCL fever for nigh on a decade now, even before the uh, the malady was officially diagnosed. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I'm closer to Susanna on this one. <laughs> no. Susanna's like not sure if she has it or not. I, I, I love watching that on this show. Yeah. She's uh, pretty sure she doesn't, actually. Yeah. yeah. I actually did catch literal CCL fever once. I, we had a game in Panama, <laughs> and I got physically just so sick. One of the sickest... Uh, trips I've ever been on in my life, and I just was, it was a wreck. Was it you? So I've lived this. Like, you guys are just talking about <laughs> <laughs> I've lived this. You guys are just analysts. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. That's great stuff. Pete right now kind of with the second segment. Yeah, Kaylin being ill is great With stuff. Peter Vermees. Like, how, <laughs> hold on. How ill are we talking right now? Like, you, could Did you, you play? Were, yeah, could you play? Was this Michael Jordan no, game or what? I didn't play. I was rooming with Matt Kanji. He wanted to stay oh, as far you. away from me as possible. Let, shout out to the to the legend. MLS Kanji. Cup winner. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, and it was it was bad. We were in paradise, too. We had the most beautiful hotel in Panama City. There was a pool, a beach. It, it was, I was wanting to get out there and get it on the gram, and I, I couldn't even do that. That's wow. how bad it was. Wow. Ungrammable. Did you the know, gram exist? Oh, yeah. I was, I was private at the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Early Graham days. Nowadays, that'd be a whole story, man. You'd have oh, snappy yeah. transitions. It would be a beautiful Don't thing. Don't scroll back too far on uh -huh. my Instagram. Yeah, we won't. <laughs> 10 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. That's when uh, Sporting KC go to Monterey. We're going to talk about that in the second segment. The mailbag after that with some nice shout-outs and also some shade for uh, some big-time head coaches from somebody from Switzerland. That's how far the ETR umbrella reaches. But let's talk week five in Major League Soccer. And we have to start with one place, and that is Toronto FC, my cup. Floweth over with poison. I didn't exactly oh, deliver you that, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking this bad week, right metaphor thing you're obsessed with, ah, and you've murdered ah, it. Let me get a first of all, that. you were saying chalice before. Yeah, well, I was going to get the chalice. Yeah, you're drinking a chalice of poison. Exactly. Right, so uh, let me walk you through this Weebyism. Uh, Weeby was on the TFC train all of last year until the thing just crashed into the gulch. And to be fair, I was as well. That was well. only like with two weeks left in the season. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I still thought it was going to be okay. And, and and so he believes that he drank from a poison chalice, yes. which corrupted his brain yes. and did not allow him to see their failings as a team. And now with Pazuelo here, Alejandro Pazuelo, Weeby is once again My drinking from... The poisoned chalice. My cup runneth over, I think was what I was going there for. Go. And I just completely biffed it. But oh my God, Alejandro. Your cup runneth over is a good I thing. still say if there was no Campionas Cup, they would have made a deep run in the playoffs. Oh, that threw him off, man. <laughs> that threw him off. Uh, Alejandro Pozuelo, they paid $11 million for him reportedly. That's the third highest fee in MLS history behind Pitti Martinez and Barquito in Atlanta. And it took a long time. Ali Curtis went through a lot to get this deal done. There were some times you didn't think it was going to happen. Pozuelo had to pressure Gank in Belgium just to let him go, basically. Well, they finally got the deal gun. They finally got him on the field. And then he just went out and, like, had an – he's like, I'm going to embarrass people today. Like, I'm going to get on this field, and I'm just going to be uh, – you know what? Chip with my left foot. Sean Johnson diving back. Oh, I'd already done a Panenka? Oh, cool. Oh, I've already had, like, seven key passes and an assist and maybe should have had more. This was – Maybe the best debut no. in MLS history. No, it was not. I said maybe. Zlatan's was better. I said maybe. But this is up there with every other debut. He was he was awesome. And it wasn't just that he was putting up box score numbers. It was 
he was fun to watch. Like nutmegging Alex Ring in central midfield, the Panenka, the chip, the through ball to Josie. Like he seemed to have the the whole thing. It took forty minutes before I figured out whether he was actually left footed or right footed. It was awesome to watch. And what was striking to me was how much different he is than Javinko. Because with Javinko, and, and look, we, we knew this. We knew his build is more of a Vasquez type of playmaker, and Javinko is a second forward. He's going to shoot every time he's within 30 yards of the goal. And like that was how Toronto were constructed, to play to Javinko and to have him make magic or maybe have him and Josie make magic together. And that was pretty much it. With Pazuelo, he was there to tie the whole thing together. And it took him 20 minutes to figure out how to do it. And then he just annihilated NYCFC. And this reinvigorates a club. CCL was not pretty. They go to Panama, not pretty. They get eliminated, not pretty. There's some question marks about personnel, about wingers, about Javinko leaving, about where this team would be. Maybe the poison chalice truly is poisoned. <laughs> but you walk into the training ground today, Kalen, and it's all good. I mean, it's all good when your debut guy is having his teammates point to him after the game. Or right? Josie. Yeah, or oh, Josie like, like, on the back post, yeah, throwing yeah. his hands up, just like, how did he do it? Yeah, they were all in awe. I've, ha- I've actually had that experience once in uh, early Chicago Fire days when Guatemoc Blanco, another number 10, came to Chicago. And we had a good team at the time. We, you know, Chris Rolfe. Uh, we, we had some really nice pieces around him, but we just didn't quite connect the way we needed to without him. And you look at some of the auda- audacious plays that Pozuelo was able to put. Well, that was Blanco. I remember on his debut, we played against Celtic in a friendly. He did a, a, a he did yeah. literally his entire catalog of <laughs> greatest hits. I mean, he did a back pass off his back. He did the bunny hop in between two didn't defenders. Did he do the butt trap like first five minutes? Yeah, he yeah. Did, he literally did everything. <laughs> he scored a goal. I think he I think he did a, a panenka on a on a on a goal. Was there the run up on the free kick? The like eighty yard run up <laughs> Probably, it did everything <laughs> oh. and it, but the the part of it though was it gave the team some personality i tried chipping the goalkeeper against and i, I hit the crossbar but <laughs> i would never do that i don't think i did that before i didn't definitely didn't do it afterwards but there was just something about his personality he was able to give the rest of the guys something and the best players don't take a lot of time to be able to integrate into a team because you may not be able to play like Blanco, but you can start to see the game a little bit the way that he does, where players will begin to anticipate. And you saw that with Jonathan Osorio with the little back heel to him. And then I thought the most important goal they had was the one between Pozuelo to Josie mm-hmm. because it showed those two immediately have a relationship. And yes, we can say Pozuelo joining the team is huge. Getting Josie back has been massive for this team. The last game against the game winner comes back again here. So I think when you see that attack together, it looks really balanced now. Dave, the Eastern Conference looks kind of open, to be honest with you. And maybe I'm just trying to convince myself that it's all good, that I should get back on the train. But like DC at the top, the crew have been good, but maybe they don't have the level of talent at the top end that Toronto FC do. Is this the resurgence? Is this year the bounce back year? For Toronto FC? Yeah. I think so. I, I think that we're going to have a conversation for a while in the future about if this is a bounce back year or the next era. Right? Is this the same? What we see over the next few years with Pasuelo and Josie as the linchpins, is that going to be the continuation of 2015 and 16 and 17? Or is it the next step? Um, and I think in all of this conversation, we have to give a tip of the cap to Ali Curtis because he came into a new team. He trusted that scouting to make the most expensive signing in club history. That wasn't his guy. That was TFC's guy, and he got it over the edge. But he trusted that at a moment when Javinko leaves and the future of the franchise is in question. Um, so that's. I think the biggest emotional part we saw from fans over the weekend was like, this is the future and we'll be okay and we're going to enjoy this. On the Eastern Conference side, yeah, if Atlanta and New York Red Bulls don't want to play soccer, then everyone has a shot in the Eastern Conference. Not even going to mention NYCFC? No, I don't care. Um, But for Toronto (laughs) FC, there's still going to be question marks on the back line. There's still question marks across the field, but if you can't defend and Pozuelo can do that and Josie's healthy, then you can win 5-4. Three wins and three games for Toronto FC, nine points. That's good math for them. The math for LAFC leaves them at the top of the Supporters' Shield standings in the top of the Western Conference, 13 points from five, four wins, one draw, plus 10 goal differential. They're working people over, and they went to San Jose with a 32-52 and won 5 nothing. This game was not close. 5 nothing actually was, I think, maybe a kind scoreline. For the earthquakes, like Sporting KC laid seven on Montreal. This could have been seven, eight. I mean, it, 
it could have been that bad. Fortunately, it was not for the earthquakes. But Carlos Vela says he wants to be the MVP. Bob Bradley says he wants Carlos Vela to be like Lionel Messi. Carlos Vela got three goals. He put on uh, the greatest hits again, as you said. Kalen, that left foot, the bender, just put it on repeat. He probably has five of those goals in his time in Major League Soccer. So plot me the course. How does he win MVP? How could this go down? Well, he, he, I think last year was tough because he started off the year similarly. He, he was great in the beginning of the season, carried that form into the World Cup, and maybe that was a part of it, was he was motivated with the World Cup waiting. He had a, a man-of-the-match performance against Germany, so they got a great result. Then they crashed out. The, the issue for me in the second half of the season was, was part on him. I'll put a big part of it on him because he's a designated player. And I, I thought the biggest place he went missing was in the playoffs against Real Salt Lake at home in that first round matchup where they lost. But the pieces around him were really still changing in flux with LAFC. We have to remember that. They didn't bring in Ramirez. They had just brought in Diomande. They brought in Lee Wynn. There were so many changes. They had lost Simon. There were so many changes. Mark Anthony K got hurt. He went down. That was a big one. There were so many changes for them last season that I felt like Carlos kind of lost his way a little bit, and he didn't grab the games in the moments he needed to. Now this team overall has changed, but Carlos has as well. He's, he's stepping up in games that I wasn't expecting to, or maybe when the game suited him, when you're playing against Portland and they're down a man, and then you say, okay, Carlos is going to run, run up the score a little bit. But the game against NYCFC away, small pitch, physical match they were all over him he finds two goals in that one and then this one a little bit of the killer instinct that was maybe missing where before he could have been content to say oh, i have one goal two goals. Oh, i have a nice day now but he was still pushing forward and taking these games to get three goals against uh, a, a, a san jose team that, that really didn't have much of a chance. it's consistency yeah i mean if he does this consistently he, he probably will be the mvp because he has six goals and three assists in five games he's got 20 and 16 and 33 since entering the league i mean that that's crazy that's close to best ever pace which is as you mentioned last night matt jovinko yeah 22 and 16 in, in 2015 which to be fair was a lower scoring season than what we've had the last couple of years um and what we're on track for already this year get back to me in june we were saying the same things about Carlos Vela this time last year. Maybe being ex- exiled from the Mexican national team is part of it. I, I think he understood that um, he needs to be really impressive to get Tata to trust him. Um, the other thing is it, Carlos Vela knows Mexico's watching him. And they're also watching Matias Almeida. And he went out there, I think, wanting to embarrass Almeida's team. And he did. And he can do that. But we've seen this throughout the past 10, 11, 12 years since he's been a professional, for a month at a time, he'll be the best player in whatever league he's in, and then he disappears. But he's never had the level of importance on his shoulders. He's always been the striker for his teams in Spain, but he's never been the leader, the captain, all those things, which is what we saw last year Bob Bradley try and push on him. is like, you need, we need more from you because you need to be more than just a good player. You need to be the guy who leads this franchise. And the other piece that Kalen mentioned was the World Cup. I just think... For the role he had on that team, to be a Mexican international and lose in the round of 16 in the World Cup is a devastating experience after that Germany game. So I think psychologically, whether he goes to Gold Cup or not this year, he's going to be in a different place when he comes back to LAFC than he was last year. And if you get that extra six weeks of quality soccer, seven weeks of quality soccer from him, then you're talking about eye-popping numbers. He's pretty much at the top right now of your very, very, very early MVP rankings. Who else is in the running? Because it takes a full season of brilliance. You know, we would have said Joseph Martinez or Pity Martinez, but right now the wheels are falling off in Atlanta, so uh, maybe not them. Who is in the running? Wayne Rooney's up there, considering what what they've done. Uh, I don't know Ladero? if there's. I, I, Ladero's been good. There's, he hasn't been as good the last couple of weeks, which is weird because Seattle are still excellent and unbeaten. I I have trouble picking an MVP from Sporting KC uh, because there's just such a well-constructed, well-balanced team. In general... The team is the star. Yeah, the team is the star, exactly. Exactly. Did uh, Alejandro Pozuelo start to weasel his way in there? I'm sure. I- I'm sure. Look, Zlatan got here the last week of March last year, and he was in the MVP race right until the last weekend when he laid an absolute egg in the biggest uh, game of the year for for the Galaxy. So if, if Zlatan was in it, then Pozuelo could be in it. Right now, with what... 11, 12 percent of the season done. It is Vela. Yeah, sorry, I was gonna add on to that. Everyone's in it, Weeby. 
Okay. It's literally the fifth Fine. week of the season. Fine. Everyone who Fine. plays well. No one Fine. will remember this part of the season if you play well for Oh, me. nobody wants to have any fun. Prognosticate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. it's Monday morning, man. All Come right. on. Well, let's talk about something that's definitely happening. We don't have to guess about it, and that is that more young attackers are playing in this league than ever before. Doyle, Paxton Pomichol had a huge weekend, two goals, a win for Dallas over RSL. But you did the math here. <laughs> there is a significant shift in the amount of minutes and the production going to teenage domestic attacking players. Yeah, it's it's something that we we actually have never really seen in this league before. Um, and if you think back to the last 10, 12 years since the homegrown rule has been around, it's mostly been defenders and occasional goalkeepers like Bill Hamid. Um, we just haven't seen domestic uh, attacking players break into teams, especially at young ages. Alfonso Davies did it for Vancouver, but we could all say Alfonso Davies, just in terms of his level and his ability as a 15, 16, 17-year-old, almost feels like a one-off. The real struggle has been to get like lesser talents um, to be able to compete with veterans in MLS. And, and it started to change in a big way. And I'll, I'll give you the numbers. In 20, 2016, only three American teenaged attackers played in MLS in 2017 over the course of the whole season it was seven in all of 2018 it was 12 uh in 2019 in one month we've already had 12 and they're, they're up to six goals and five assists in about 1200 minutes which betters the total from they had all of last season to me this is the homegrown rule uh and this is the start of the USSDA the U.S. Soccer Development Academy back in 2007 which the idea was we have to get better coaching for our best kids. And it's taken a while, and I think if you talk to coaches around the league, they'll say for the first five years of this thing, nobody had any idea what they were doing, which is why 2013, 14, 15, no homegrown players, especially in attack where teams spend their money, were getting on the field. But now we have a situation where Paxton Pomacall can go out there and not just be a good player, but literally FC Dallas's best player week after week after week. Jesus Ferreira gets in there, goal and assist. Brendan Aronson, you put him in as a 10 one week, and he's winning games for you, and you put him in as an 8, as a shuttler on the side of the diamond the next week, and he's locking teams down. This didn't happen even last year. The Ferreira ones and the Aronson ones are the ones that stand out to me. Pomacall played great, but one... When you talk about those young American attackers, they were always like big body center forwards if they were getting chances, right? It was Jack McBean. Ferreira is like, this guy has the skill and the IQ to play whatever position I put him out there to do, and I can use him in different roles, which isn't something coaches have trusted American players with, and the one with Aronson is the same. Yeah, every once in a while a U.S. Academy player or a Canadian Academy would get a shot when a star was hurt. But then when they come back, they get pushed out of the lineup. Jim Curtin has known Brendan Aronson basically his entire life, and he trusts him. So he says, I know he can do a job for me if it's not this role he's already been successful at. Slides him out wide. Same with Luigi Gonzalez. So now you're starting to see a connection from the head coach and the technical directors through the academies where there's trust and belief in these players that they can do the job because one of the things we say all the time is everyone has to win. It's a job still, and you know no one's going to throw out young academy players that aren't ready to, to play or are going to lose games for you. I know that this seems normal now, but I th don't think we can really understate how new this is. Th this whole homegrown thing, and, and it really is the, the cases of Alfonso Davies that – I think does push forward other clubs to say, yeah. this makes sense for us financially. We could really benefit from this. And I know he's, you know, sort of an outlier because he's special, but I think there's more out there. And part of it is the shift of, of coaches recognizing it, where I don't even know if there was really at times a thought of two, three years ahead as far as depth chart, let alone, uh, you know, you hear Peter Vermees has a list eight deep going down to like U14. Which, which is awesome. Is awesome and insane to me because I played for the Chicago Fire at a time when we this first started, right, where we were just starting to sign young players. And there were a couple kids that signed and you were like, wow, this kid's really talented. And there was one kid, uh, oh, shoot. I'm now, this is showing my age, I'm, black, I'm, I'm messing up, but I remember Carlos de los Cobos was our coach. And this kid played right back for us all the time. Like every week in, in, in our squad scrimmages. And then we played against them in the U-17s uh, in Florida in preseason, or U-20s, I want to say. And he was, a, he was a left winger, 
<laughs> and in a 4-3-3. And I was like, why are they playing you out there? And he's like, well, that's where I always play with the national team. And I was like, what? I thought you were right back for the last <laughs> year. But we just didn't have enough right backs. So we were just saying, oh, somebody's hurt. Throw him out there. That was the way we were approaching homegrown players. It was sort of like, he's a hometown kid. Let him, let him get out here. He's on the team. I don't know if it was marketing or what. Now you look ahead and you say, look at the plan. Look at the clubs that are doing this right and finding young players, giving them opportunities. And this is part of the success of Luchi Gonzalez. It's part of the reason why he's gotten the job. It's part of the reason why he will keep the job is because he's proving this successful. Now the next step is can they move somebody on to Europe? Can Philadelphia Union, can they sell Mark McKenzie on? Can they find some value to make this come good in the same way that Atlanta made their project come good with Almiron? More clubs need to find ways to monetize these young players. Uh, the t- the bow on top of this weekend, Ricardo Pepe, hat trick. Oh, yeah. In the first yeah. game for North Texas, said he should have scored four. Let's go. The yeah. future is bright. He, he should have scored six. <laughs> he, he probably should have. He probably should have. Uh, look, young players, you know it warms our heart here on Extra Time. Play your kids, play your kids, play your kids. But the stars still matter. Wayne Rooney, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, those were the Ooh. stars on Sunday. What academies they Wins go for both <laughs> DC United and the LA Galaxy. 2-1 on both counts. Uh, what did we learn, Doyle? What did you learn from Sunday? Uh, I don't even remember. Really? <laughs> I mean, what did we what did we learn from those games? Well, you said you learned that the Galaxy looks better without Zlatan. <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe you should. Like, it's like 57, don't do it, 43. Well. And they all I got scared to say it. it I did second. not catch the Bobby Warshaw impression there, and I feel ashamed of myself. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I, I, I was doing my Bobby impression. Uh. Bobby's thing for the past year, and really since he's ever been watching Zlatan, is that teams defer to him too much, and he changes the way his own team's play and I think we saw a little of that with the Galaxy they weren't as flowing and free through midfield the movement wasn't necessarily quite as good up top as it was two weeks ago against Minnesota United I think it's a one-off he's coming back from an injury you're better off with Zlatan out there but like at least one data point in Bobby's column Team no, Bobby. I'm Team Bobby. Kaylin, yeah. Kaylin is just sliding back. <laughs> Stay with us, Kaylin. Stay with us. Stay in that chair, please. Please. Dave, what did you learn? Get a little coffee for you. Yeah, yeah. Right. Get a little pick, pick me up there. What did you learn, Dave? I learned a couple things from this weekend. So I thought, or from Sunday, I thought it was like a, a good set of games in general. I thought Orlando had a good game plan in terms of when they came out with their subs, giving more energy and changing the way they play. And that's what I think looking forward you're going to have to see from them is – can they play that way all the time? And can they play with high energy? And can they do that all the time? Desperate? Yeah, I think so. And I think that's okay because they've been a bad team. Yeah. And that's going to help you win. They kind of have to be desperate, honestly, given the results that they've had. And I don't know if you can start a game that way. And I don't think you're bringing subs on in the 30th minute. But, you know, they had a different roster out there that wanted to play a different soccer from the 60th minute on. And that's when they were most successful. But they, t- that, they were just desperate. They took out their two center midfielders and then put on – Two wingers. <laughs> so th- that was uh, just a move, I think. I think the game plan actually for Orlando was was pretty good overall, and they were in a good shape. They just gave up these two set-piece goals, which is my big takeaway. And it's it's <laughs> sort of a personal pet f- peeve, and, you know, I, I don't really get a chance to talk about these things much, but, you know, now I'm on extra time. I figure this is the right venue for my exactly. rant on— Every Monday, man. —on zonal marking on set-pieces. <laughs> I just will never understand it. I went back and watched this Orlando City— First set piece that they gave up to Steve Birnbaum. And they've got a line of four across their six. And then they have, a, I think, another line of three in front. But nobody actually, I don't even, I tried to see it. I don't think anybody actually touches a player from D.C. United. <laughs> Birnbaum kind of goes a little bit to the back and then cuts in front. It was one of the easiest goals he'll ever score. And he's one of the best players in MLS. For me, in the you air. have to, in the air, yeah. yeah, yeah. If, if, excuse me. <laughs> Just <yeah>. want to. Yeah. <laughs> he went to Berkeley, so you know, <laughs> hyperbole. But he, it, those guys, you have to have. I, if you can, you can put some guys on on the uh, six, right? And you want to get somebody in that front. There's a, just do a, a mix of man and zone marking. Absolutely, you have to like at least bump Steve Birnbaum so he doesn't get like that. He's he LeBron. That he, he just, is the target. If you put Sane That's on him dude. and he gets dunked on, hey. Yeah. Sorry, you know, and if you put Sané on him and another small guy, then you got a better chance. But if you just let Steve Birnbaum run on or Chad Marshall run on with a free run-up, I just, 
You deserve to lose. You deserve to lose. And that's what happened. Woo! I also found out. Halen wearing weekend. black. <laughs> Working dark these days. I like it. <laughs> I found out that my girlfriend follows everyone on social media in MLS because Steve Birnbaum did the, the pregnancy. Baby, yeah. And she goes, he just got married. And I was like, oh, okay. Wait, why do you know that? What? All of a sudden, Instagram <laughs> opens up. Turns out she follows everyone and their plus one. Nice. Congratulations to Steve Birnbaum. Yes. Uh, Little disconnect, you know. He said he doesn't score often. I, I'm not going to end there. I'm just going to walk away right now. For Portland, though, they lost poison again. Poison chalice. <laughs> yeah, that was the poison chalice. At San Jose is next. So, hey, Timbers fans, you got an opportunity to get your first win of the season at San Jose on April 6th. You go to Dallas after that, to Columbus after that, Toronto after that, to RSL. So, the next five. There's two ones. RSL, and I think San Jose you got to be looking at. Giovanni Savarese says he feels that this team is going to win more games than they lose, and that he leaves the sensation that the first win is just around the road. So they hope got that, that sensation a lot, gets realized. They got a lot, not a lot better. They got better as this game went along. So there's something positive there. Yeah. Uh, we're going to put out a tweet here before we go to break, and we want to revisit the panic rankings, but I think we're going to have to do that on Thursday's show. Panic one, all good. No worries here. Everybody knows we're going to be all right. Panic two, bad luck. Just wait till we're healthy, in form, at home, et cetera, et cetera. Panic button three, concerned? Yes. Panicked? Not yet. Four, it's time to start bailing water. And five, this ship might just sink. Atlanta United, Red Bulls, NYCFC, Portland, Real Salt Lake. I think you can find your way onto that spectrum. In the meantime, we're going to break. On the other side, Peter Vermees and CCL Fever. Are you watching the games or just looking at the stats? Email the show at extratime at mlssoccer.com Tweet at Extra Time or text the Hot Take Hotline with any questions or reactions. And into a new team, I, I think it's imperative. Here's Gianluca Busio finding the back of the net. And Sporting KC lead by a touchdown. Back now in Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS studios in Midtown. We go to our AT&T call to the field all the way to Kansas City and Sporting KC head coach Peter Vermees. Peter, how's it going? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing pretty well. Maybe not as well as a head coach that just got a touchdown. I know that that's you know, neither here nor there, but seven goals, the way this team is playing, is this the best attacking team you've ever had? What makes it so special? Uh, I, I, don't, I mean, I, I guess you probably would say, yes, it is the best attacking team that we have had, but I think it has a lot to do with quality of players and has to do with uh, their commitment. Um, they they understand when we have to be better in something and they're willing to uh, accept it. Um, there's a lot of self-reflection with the group, and at the same time, they are commitment to, to working to improve in aspects of our game. So uh, I think it has a lot to do with, with you know, um, their, their, their ability and, and, and want of, of being better. I'm doing a little self-reflection right now, Peter about all the talk about a number nine and a designated player signing. Why, why, why would we doubt you and Christian Namath? There is a chemistry there, and I think you're the only head coach that's got double-digit goals out of him in his career. How do you get the most out of this guy? Well, first off, I, I believe in him. I think he is a I, – I have a different perspective than most, and that is I think he is an old-school center forward in that – he is, in, in a lot of ways, very similar to Aguero. I think Aguero is the same. If you look around the world, there's a lot of forwards that have, they have specific attributes, but they're not, they're not all-encompassing. And I think uh, Christian encompasses, just like Aguero does, all those qualities. He can play with his back to the goal. He can play in between the lines. He can run into the channel. He can give the final pass. He can create his own goal. He can... Uh, he has a composure, and he's cold as ice in certain situations. Like when he scored, when he scored his final goal, the seventh goal, to, he faked like three times before he actually finished it off. There's a lot of players that don't have that composure in that moment, um, and so he can score with his head, he can score with his left, his right. He he, he just has all those qualities, and so um, I've always believed in him. I've always known that he's his best position. You know, you probably know this better than most, and that is. I've always believed that he's probably more of a nine than he is a seven or 11 where we played him when he first came here, but we had Dom Dwyer and he could, I knew that he could play there um, probably better than Dom could meaning out wide. And that was the reason why we used him. We also used him more as a second forward than maybe a true winger. 
Um, but I think he's more in his place now than ever before. The other player who's had a revelation this year is Gerso Fernandez. It's taken him a couple of years. You mentioned that he has the best movement in Major League Soccer. For simpletons like us, explain that, what you see when you see him play. So uh, it's the movement off the ball. Um, it, you know, it, it takes a, a selfless attitude and mentality to make runs off the ball like he does because you don't always get them. But you also know that sometimes when one guy makes a, uh, a movement – it actually creates an opportunity for someone else, and he's selfless in that regard. Um, what, what has gotten better over the last couple of years for him is the timing of his runs. Um, he's more um, in sync with the person on the ball um, and understands when they're able to actually make that pass so that his run isn't too early or it's too late. Um, his timing is, as you know, I don't want to say it's perfected, but man, it's gotten a lot better than than where it was before, and so um, that's helped our team immensely. Johnny Russell and again, it's it's his movement, but it's also creating opportunities for other players. Johnny Russell, nearly unplayable, it seems. That jacket he wore, that's unwearable for I think anybody but Johnny Russell. I, I'm curious, Peter. Maybe you're on the field defending him now. You're in what looks like the best shape of your life, but in your prime, how would you try to defend Johnny Russell? <clears throat> well, I think what a lot of teams do is they, they stack him up. You know, they, they, uh, if you're 1v1, it's not, an easy, it's not easy. I think you have to delay him. Um, that's what I would say. You have to delay if you try to go win the ball. He's incredibly uh, gifted to go both left and right. Um, and then the other is, is that he has uh, this, this incredible ability to dribble multiple players in succession, right? A lot of guys are good on the first guy, but they, they don't know how to time the second guy, and he's very good at that as well. I, I, I think teams do it. They try sometimes to stack them up with uh, multiple players, but, man, he has a good way of imbalancing you there too. Where he is less dangerous, if you stack him up and you don't have other players that are in good movement, then all of a sudden, he, he, like most players, they become one-dimensional. When he has other options, I think it makes it really difficult to play against him. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that I don't think that this gets talked about a lot. He's a really durable guy. Um, if you look at last year when he played you know, over 18 uh, months with us straight, you know, coming off his time in the championship and then coming to us and playing the whole time, uh, you know, he's, he's always ready to play. Um, and then he travels for, you know, his country and comes back and he's available. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a tough guy. He's a really is a tough guy. The MLS form is commendable, Peter, but we're here to talk about CONCACAF Champions League Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern. UDN, Yahoo Sports streaming it in English. You guys go to Monterrey, to El Monumental. I remember an anecdote after the 2013 MLS Club, Cup excuse me, where you said to Rob Heineman after the game, if the reports, of course, were correct, that it was time to go after CCL. You're the last team standing in MLS. What does this tournament mean to you to sport in Kansas City? Um, I, I think it would be uh, an incredible opportunity for us to advance into the finals. So it's something that from the very beginning, um, when we knew that we, were, we qualified for this competition, that we were already thinking about the competition then, um, and we were building our team towards uh, that, you know, this competition. So, yeah, I think it's uh, for any team in our league, um, it is definitely a, a huge uh, carrot that's out there that we would all like to conquer um, for many reasons. Obviously, selfishly for our club, um, selfishly for the league, um, Mexico has dominated the competition. Um, rightfully so. They have been great. They have uh, very, very good teams, and they're also very seasoned. And so it is, it is a combination of things. It's one, it's winning the competition. It's, it's putting ourselves into a place where now we can be a part of the conversation, which we're not currently. Um, but, you know, we, I think that the one place where we are is we are very well grounded to understand that for us to do anything, we have to get through Monterey. And right now they're the best team left in this competition. Um, as everybody is talking about, and don't even see us obviously competing, but we're going to do everything we can. We have our first leg there. It's, we know it's going to be difficult. We know what they are really, really strong at, and there's a lot of good quality in that team, and we'll have to be on our best game, and we'll have to be in good form, 
to uh, to try to get any type of result um, against that team. You mentioned the MLS quality of we all want an MLS team to win. It, the league's been doing better the last few years. Are there things that you talk to the TFC, New York Red Bull, Seattle about in preparation? Is there things you've learned over the last few years that have allowed Sporting KC this year to be more comfortable and stronger in this competition? Not really. Um, obviously, we've watched what some of the other teams have done, and we pay attention to those things, but we've kind of forged our own um, you know, roadmap, if you will. Uh, if you just look at us against Toluca and using the, the altitude tents and things like that and then training in Albuquerque, New Mexico, those not saying that, oh, my gosh, we came up with something that was completely different. It was just we felt that there was a way for us to go and uh, try to – get through the first round against Toluca because they're a really good team. And the challenge was going to be that altitude situation, not having played any competitive matches yet. And now we got to go play in, you know, altitude. So it's just, we've looked at it um, based on our team. We spent, like I said before, it wasn't like, Oh, as soon as the season was over this year, we started thinking about um, CONCACAF. It wasn't it at all. We were already building in, in our 2018. We were already thinking then that we got to build that team for 2019 and our CONCACAF uh, uh, competition. So it's been, it's been thought about for a long time. Uh, the great thing is, is that owners, our owners have supported it uh, 100% in the way that we've gone about our business, um, making sure that we travel correctly. As I said to you, the altitude tents and all those types of things, going to different areas for training. Um, you know, we added two different weeks now, um, in preseason that we never had before in different locations. And so th- they've supported us. Um, all that's helped. But, you know, at the end, it comes down to the competition. And, y- again, this game we know coming up Thursday night is going to be extremely difficult. They're a strong team. But at the same time, uh, I think that we'll be at least ready to compete. Monterey has been running people off the field in Liga MX all year. You've been doing this for 11 years. They're a strong team. Are they the strongest team you've ever coached against? Probably. I, I think that the thing is, that, you know, if you compare it, like I've done the comparison on their roster, <clears throat> when you look at their, um, their starting lineup, they have 10 DPs. If you were to compare in how our league puts together a roster, they have 10 DPs in their starting 11. Um, they have three DPs on the bench, and they f- have another five TAM guys on their roster as well. And then they probably have another three or four on the roster that are somewhere between – uh, two and four hundred thousand dollars, and so as you guys know, in building a roster, that's not even close to what uh, how how we're able to build a roster in MLS. But what I would say is, where we've tried to bridge the gap is consistency in our in our team, meaning that not a lot of changes from last year, um, which really helped us get to our model of play quicker. And then the last thing I would say is that you know where I think the Mexican teams have been so much better than us. It's, it's not necessarily in the play on the field, but they are really, really, really strong mentally. And that is something I think that we have tried to get better at um, because they know how to manage a game. They know how to go into someone else's uh, territory and get a result. And it's something that we have been, you know, trying again to improve on. And I think we're getting there. Just we'll find out if we're there yet or not. That mentality part, Peter, makes me think of that final goal again in this game against Montreal. Your whole back line was upset about it, and I immediately thought, oh, Monterey, I bet they're already thinking ahead that that won't be acceptable. But you mentioned model of play. I remember when you were the original high-press coach in MLS, and it was this big change, and it was so interesting, and now a lot of teams are doing something similar, but now you're based around possession. Did your views change? Did the league change? What changed? Well, I, I think, first of all, you – uh, you consistently have to evolve. Um, I also think that the league is changing. Um, if you look at 2013, and I don't mean this, you know, this is not a disrespectful uh, comment here. The league was different. There's a lot more quality in the league today than ever before. And I don't think you can just go out and just press all the time because there are teams that can break you down. And when they do, you wind up actually expending a lot more energy than, uh, uh, than, than, than the other. So as we keep possession, make no mistake about it, our objective is to try to create, create as many high-quality chances as possible. To do that, you, know, you, you have to 
have players that can keep the ball. You have to have players that can make the kind of movements that you're looking for. But I just think the league is changing, and we're get, we have to constantly evolve with that. The other thing, too, is, look, you know this uh, very well just because you used to cover us as, as, a, as a team when you were here. Um, we're not spending like other teams, and we have to do things differently to make sure that we consistently stay competitive in our league and in these other competitions that we play in. And to do that, we have to, we have to constantly get better with our game. And so keeping the ball is an important aspect, but it's not just to keep the ball. It's, it's really about, as I said, creating high-quality chances. We eliminate the other team. They don't have the ball that much. Then hopefully we cut down on the number of chances that they have. And then the other piece is, is that our climate – in our season changes dramatically. And so when you get to the summer months, you know, if you can't hold the ball and you wind up chasing a lot, it starts to become uh, uh, difficult for your team to withstand 90 minutes of just onslaught of the other team having the ball and chances, and hopefully you can take advantage of that. And so that's, that's really been the progression. It's been fascinating to watch, Peter. We are looking forward to this game on Thursday. We now have to get to the training field. I have to ask you, though, about the U.S. national team and what you've seen so far under Greg Berhalter. Uh, what stands out? Yeah, I think Greg's done a – he and his staff have done a fantastic job because what's very um, evident when you watch them play is that the players all know their role and responsibility in the way that they are playing that night. Um, they – uh, the model is, is when, it's, when it's being played because he's made some adjustments. Again, it's, it's well understood by the players, and you can see them trying to invoke that when they're playing. Now, it doesn't happen all the time, but even just their last game, that, uh, when, they, when they were playing against Ecuador and they sat back as much as they did, that's not easy to, to break down, especially when you don't have a team – you know, for a whole year when you're bringing them in for a short period of time and now saying, okay, this is what we're going to have to deal with. How do we do this in a short period of time and get all these guys on the same page? And I think they're doing an excellent job of that. Um, and it's good to see that there's also a fight that comes with wearing that jersey um, that you're starting to see again. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really, really good to see. All right, Peter, thank you so much for the time. Congratulations on the run so far in MLS and CCL. We'll be watching on Thursday, okay? Thank you, guys. Big thanks to Peter Vermees for joining us here on Extra Time, driven by Continental for our AT&T call to the field, 10 p.m. Eastern on Thursday in Monterrey, Sporting Kansas City, leg one of their CCL semifinal. You can watch it on UDN and Yahoo Sports. I am, in fact, a little bit clammy. It's Warm. the beginnings of what we know very well to be CCL fever, and we are ecstatic. I mean, I am like, I'm tingling right now. Magical. To have magical. Peter Brownell, <laughs> a.k.a. the Magic Man, a.k.a. Box to Box, a.k.a. TV no regards. The discoverer of CCL Fever on the line. Pete, what's up, man? How are we doing, gentlemen? How's everything? It's very good, and we're finally telling the story that must be told. So take us back. Where did CCL Fever come from? What is the origin story? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think like a lot of viruses, um, you know, there's no true way to tell exactly what the origin is, right? There's a lot of theory. So uh, I had some help with some, some research committee here to, to come up with the best theory. And, and what we think we found is we first sort of sensed it around 2013 during a Galaxy Metapon game, I believe. And as you're all aware of the, the Optus space, the two of you know it quite well, you know, it can be some tight corridors sometimes. So, so things spread quickly. And, you know, this competition is so special in that, you know, we have a staff that understands uh, the teams from both competitions, League MX and MLS. And so there's just a lot of excitement. And then uh, you sort of see what unfolds time and time again sometimes, and it, uh, it becomes a little bit uh, nauseating, I guess, in some <laughs> cases. Uh, so, you know, we sort of noticed it in 2013. Uh, we sent a tweet at it, and... Uh, here we are today. Absolutely. Starting those Opta offices across from where the MLSsoccer.com was my boss. Was. Yeah, the contagion was <laughs> just everywhere in those days, and it's only grown yeah. since then. It's become this massive, I mean, a, almost a cultural movement, I want to say. But we need a definition. Yeah. We need you to get okay. out your Webster's Dictionary and, and kind of walk us through so we know when we have it and people who don't know if they have it can confirm their diagnosis. What's the definition? 
All right, absolutely. And, you know, I, I don't think this is the, the gold standard for a definition, but I did uh, write this down instead of doing my taxes this weekend. So I put <laughs> a little bit of thought into it. Um, so what I came up with is an affliction cast upon any person who experiences the magic and allure of the region's thickest competition. Mm, that sounds right. You know what? You want it to be short, straight to the point. You need to know. And that, that sums it all up. Yep. It's a cultural yeah. movement, though, Pete. I mean, people are talking about it's international it in, in Mexico. We see it everywhere. Right. The hashtag is dominating. You started something. The Opti guys, you started something. What do you think of your legacy? Listen, it's just so much fun to, to watch and see this grow and, and people enjoy it. You know, you never expect something like that's going to happen at, uh, you know, 1130 p.m. on a, a Thursday night or whatever. <laughs> um, and it's just it's just so much fun to watch, you know, especially these games. It's just like get so hyped up watching these games and, and sometimes it, it takes it over for you. So people are just getting the affliction everywhere and it's. It's amazing. So when you want to use hashtag CCL fever, when you are watching a game and just you think, think of that man oh right there, oh my God, I have CCL fever. Just know where it came from. It came from 2013 LA Galaxy, Metapan, Pete Brownell, the most interesting man in San Diego. Pete, thank you so much for sharing the story with us. All right, gents. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, we're going to have to do power rankings for interviews, and uh, as we do it, it'll be two through whatever, because number one is very clearly Pete Brownell, giving us the origin stories of CCL Fever. But it's incredible that Doyle would, before we even have the interview, claim to have had the disease before it was discovered. No, that that's is not surprising. That's what I'm saying. That's First of like, all, Doyle's been sick surprising. since the day he was born. That's true. Oh. That's very true. There was a lot of pollen in the air the day he was born. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sporting Kansas City, 7-1 winners against Montreal this weekend. That is the perfect appetizer to the main course of CONCACAF Champions League semifinals against Monterrey at El Monumental on Thursday. I will repeat again because you will not want to miss this game. 10 p.m. Eastern time. It's Yahoo Sports in English, Udian in Spanish, pregame, postgame shows, MLS Match Day Central right here in these very studios. I think it's what you, me, Doyle, Warshaw, Weeby, and then uh, Matt Lawrence <coughs> from Sporting Kansas City. Oh, my bad. It's not. It's it's Kalen. Oh, boy. <laughs> this got really awkward. I'll take the night off, but you know, uh, okay. no, I'm no, coming no. in. Yeah, you'll be there. With the hot takes? You'd be ready. Yeah. Dressed in all black? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, don't not? dress in all black. All right. That never goes well. Okay. The dress in all black is like we're going to the other team's funeral. That's a Washington Wizards move. Don't do it. Okay. Wow. It you said something interesting in the break um, about Sporting Kansas yeah. City and CONCACAF Champions League and why – just say it. What, what were you Yeah, thinking? so we haven't talked about this team a ton in this run because of the timing of the games and what's gone on. Um, when you look at what it means, it would be the first Major League Soccer team to win it. No matter what, that's going to be epic and we're going to be excited. But there's a lot of shiny new pieces to Major League Soccer. And Sporting KC rebranded and they did a great job, but – Peter Vermees has been in this league since day one. He's coached now for 11 years. He was doing the Wizards at Arrowhead. So you look at what he's gone through, and then you just look at the composition of this roster. Draft pick guys. Roger Espinoza, who came out of nowhere and fought his way through. I mean, he was a draft pick guy. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Seth Sinovic, potentially starting in the CCL final, a guy that no one wants to talk about and is never fun, but has been the core of one of the most successful teams for now he, eight he years. He threatened to resign if Montreal right. Impact to, like, to retire. Because he wanted not, to go home. Yeah, 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 and and you just look at this team: Matt Beasley and Graham Zusi, two draft pick guys, one local who made it to a World Cup, became DPS because the club did it the right way and took care of them. And then you look, you know, front to back, and DPS are changing Major League Soccer. But Peter Vermisa says, "I'm going to spend across the board. I'm going to try and build teams differently and build teams deeper and change the way that my team works." And it's just a very MLS club. And so it would be amazing if this was the first team to do it. And if they do do it, it's probably against two of the greatest teams in this region's history. Maybe Santos Laguna, which is another great club. But if it's Monterey and Tigres, it's as hard as it could possibly be. And to see those guys grind from the bottom of the American-Canadian soccer heaps all the way to the top would be special. I mean, I look, I covered this team at Arrowhead. I covered them at a Community America ballpark. I covered them when they were not good at all. And Peter Vermees truly has built this club from – Sort of an afterthought. Okay, not sort of an afterthought. Definitely an afterthought in Kansas City to one of the like prime um, community assets that people are like, yes, we have – this is our to team. the San Antonio Spurs of yeah, MLS. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. And I, I thought it was interesting what Peter said about doing the comparison in that interview between Monterrey and Liga MX side and his side and saying, you know what, Monterrey starting lineup, there are 10 DPs. 
quote unquote. On the bench, there are three more DPs. Oh, then they have like five TAM guys. And that's where it starts to make sense how he's built his team over the course of the last few years, which is to find a way through trades, through allocation, through whatever it might be, to get as many of that level players as he can because he knows not just an MLS, but in the continent, he's going to have to have those guys to stand a chance against Monterrey. I mean, it's, it's as he said, probably the toughest team he will have ever coached against. Period. That's, I mean... It's strong yeah, words. It, 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 the strong words. I mean, they're the most valuable in terms of uh, outlay and, and I think perceived global value of their players. They're the most valuable team in North American history just because they've spent so much over the last couple of years. They're not playing like it right now, though. They've been pretty bad for the past month. Their last win was, I think, the first leg against Atlanta. Uh, a couple of losses. I think they took another L this weekend as well. Sporting can do this. If they go out there and they get on the ball and they use the ball the way they did against Toluca, and, and having Fontas back made such a big difference for that. His distribution from the back is, is maybe the best in the league. Uh, they, can, they can control part of the game. They can get out of Monterey with a result, and they bring it back to Kansas City. They got a chance. You heard him after the game, Peter Ramiz, say kind of that same thing. They're like, we want to be really, really good at home. And – they're going to have the opportunity with that second leg at Sporting Park against Monterrey, but they got to get through leg one. So what does a, quote, win look like, Kalen? What would be good enough or what would be better than good in this match? I think if they can keep it under two goals on the other side, if they can get one on the road, a 2-1 would be amazing, I think. And coming off a 7-1 win, they have enough uh, spirit in the group right now. The confidence is high. And... I think I heard you talk to him about that one goal <laughs> that they gave up at the end of the match, and I think that's going to be a good lesson for them because the margins in CCL are so tight that that was a really good analogy of saying, hey, you can play 90 minutes and play fantastic at the Monumental, but then say you just let up for one moment, that might be the goal that's decisive that knocks you out of the tournament. So they have to be good in those moments, and they have to find an extra DP or an extra TAM player. Someone else needs to emerge beyond uh, the group that we already know. And I don't know if it's John Lucabusio or whoever, but we've seen the teams in the past. It's not enough. Yes, you need your best players playing at their top level, Josie Javinko, but Jonathan Osorio. Who's the one that's going to step up and find a goal and, and really emerge as a star in this tournament and for this club? Which was the piece that we liked about their offseason was they got Kellen Rowe, and even Hurtado and Rodney Wallace, just guys you can trust to play 20, 30 minutes in a setting like this and understand the moment, the mistakes you cannot make. But I think with what Kalen said, they just need to score. They need to score a goal. You can't go in a situation where you need to shut Monterey out at home, which was one of the issues that MLS ha- the MLS clubs have had so far this tournament is just not getting that one goal to put them close enough. Toronto FC was the big one in their first leg of just giving yourself a shot in the second leg and not making it. We got to go home and win 5-0. Atlanta experienced this. They were pretty good for the majority of that first leg. And then they win the second leg at home. But it was the lapse. It was the lapse at the end. It was the inevitable avalanche, which seems to always come on the road in Mexico against Liga MX clubs. At altitude. At altitude. It's not not a ton of altitude in Monterey. Okay. It's only about 2,000 feet. Like it's, it's less than Real Salt Lake. Uh, so that's not going to be a factor. What might be a factor, though, is injuries. Shalloy is out. Hurtado's out. Jalen Lindsay is out yep. as well. I, I think that's it. Um, but those, I mean, Shalloy's the big one because he, he was a difference maker at times off the bench last year. Type of guy who could just sort of show up on the back post and get you, get you, you know, a fox in the box type of goal. 10 p.m. Eastern on Thursday, UDN in Spanish, Yahoo Sports in English, the first leg of the CONCACAF Champions League semifinal between Sporting Kansas City and Monterrey. They're the last MLS club standing. We are very curious to see how this one goes and whether or not they can make history. Peter Vermees said it. They are chasing it. Let us know what you think. 401 mls Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. We will not be covering it on Thursday for timing reasons, but we'll have a complete wrap-up of that match and another preview come the next Monday. We're going to break. On the other side, the mailbag. We'll be right back. Are you watching the games or just looking at the stats? Email the show at extratime at MLSsoccer.com, tweet at extratime, or text the Hot Take Hotline with any questions or reactions. I should have scored. I promised my son three goals. And because of a bad pass, Jürgen has to pay my son. <laughs>
Back now in extra time, driven by Continental into the mailbag. You know how to get at us, 401-206-0MLS. That's the hot take hotline. Please, please, please text us or email extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Dave, what we got? Well, let's start out with fantasy. Oh, got our week how five could I winner. forget? We had Spala, Zavala, SZs are never really easy for me, who won. He is a, or she is a Montreal Impact fan, so one good thing happened for a yes, Montreal fan. Unless you pull a Toronto jersey Ooh. out of the big black trash bag of swag, and then it won't be so great. What is it going to be? Oh, oh Dynamo. <laughs> oh, Dynamo. Okay, and Albert Which, Elise signed Houston Dynamo jersey here jersey? for Sabala. Um, it is, uh, let's see, it is a medium jersey. Cool. And it's perfect because that our first email me. is from Eric in Fort Worth who says, two thoughts on the Dynamo. One, Wilmer Cabrera doesn't get enough credit for continued development of Memo, Elise, Minotas, and Lundquist. Two against Tigres in Colorado. The Dynamo have shown lethality and calm on the road. They should be in the contenders' conversation. Oof. Le- Kalen, is lethality I don't think a so. word? There's no chance. It didn't seem like it. No, I, didn't I was going to let it slide, but, you know. When I go back, and I know it talked about these homegrown players, Memo was one that was in the academy when I was playing for the Dynamo and would come up and train. And there were a couple other prospects in there that were a little bit more highly re- uh, um, regarded. Regarded, yeah, thank you. And they, they were the ones that everybody was watching, but Memo was actually the one that was always asking for advice or he was the one that was watching Boniac or watching Rico or talking to different guys around it. And he was Yourself. always the guy that you wanted to have on your team. Because they, they would come over and play, especially in the summertime when they weren't in school and train. I think he was like 15, 16 years old. So, and then I tried to do a video. I did a video for the movement down in Houston. And I had trouble. I interviewed Memo, and I had trouble getting Memo in the piece. Because they were like, well, I don't know if there's space in the piece. And now I'm like, yeah, Memo. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go back and post that whole right, video? Right. I'm to do a yeah. re-edit on that Exactly. One. <laughs> so it, to see his emergence, uh, I mean, if you would have told me he would score four goals all season, you would be like, <laughs> what a fantastic year. Yeah. He's already off to a fantastic start, and I think he's going to keep going. And the thing is, he's he's 23, which is you know not young anymore in this game of ours. And credit to him for sticking through it. And the hope is that the next Memo Rodriguez will get that chance to break through when he's 17, 18, 19 years old, which is what we're seeing from the other team in Texas right now. Levi from Lagranda says the Galaxy could only dream of scoring goals like the Timbers did last night. Instead, they rely on refs falling for Zlatan's antics. We got a lot of hate in there. There was some falling, and it was Zlatan from like clear and obvious yeah. contact from the refs. Instant replay. We won't belabor that I one. I thought that was, that was fun. a great goal from the Timbers, though. Yes, it was. Taylor from Switzerland said, there is nothing that brings me greater joy than seeing supposedly game-changing coaches getting absolutely worked by MLS. De Boyer, Dome Torrent, Matias Almeida, Remy Gard have two wins, five ties, eight losses with a negative 20 goal differential this season. All were marketed as big hires, tactical masterminds, and a new era in MLS coaching and all their jokes in MLS. Meanwhile, the old guard of MLS coaches like Peter Vermees, Bob Bradley, Ben Olsen are all sitting comfortable in the top five. I want Pep to come to MLS so we can see the soccer world collectively lose their minds when he goes 4-4-4 and in his first 12 games and finishes his first season at mid-table. MLS is the only league in the world that could humble Pep Guardiola. I think wow. you read that. Wow. I think that, yeah, <laughs> you read that with the right tone. We now know that Switzerland is not neutral. Yeah. Repeat, not <laughs> neutral. Switzerland no longer neutral in these uh, in these confines. Can I, can I say, like, I kind of get that. Like, there's a little bit of schadenfreude, but it's actually better to watch really good coaches do really good work in MLS. Like, I enjoyed like Patrick, Patrick Vieira yeah. and Tata Martino a lot. Let's go to Rooney here. Hey, guys, whether or not Rooney was fouled, he still cheated on his goal. The referee, the lines person, Rooney should be suspended for a game. Rooney took the free <laughs> kick far, far away from the spot of the foul. He placed the ball at a much better and closer angle. How in the world did the referee miss this? He then attached photos for us. Is he Rooney? Because the way you read that, you were like, Rooney says this about Rooney. And I was like, Rooney? No, his name's Alex. Oh, okay. But maybe Rooney's middle name's Alex. I mean, you know. The guy scored from the corner flag. Yeah. What do you want? He didn't score from the corner flag is the point. Oh, he, he got that little five angle. yards. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Come on, Kalen. Adjacent, you adjacent that. Olympico. Please use the correct terminology there. Kalen, from that angle, you don't think you could hit that? No. 
<laughs> uh, let's finish off Mike from South Carolina here. You guys didn't read my guarantee at the beginning of the season. I don't blame you because it sounded ridiculous, but I ro- wanted to remind you of it. Wando will break the all-time goal-scoring record this season, but it won't happen until decision day. So far, my guarantee doesn't seem too crazy right now. Yeah, it doesn't seem that crazy. I want Wando to break this thing. You know, San Jose need any and all positivity that they can get right now. I mean, it's got, I just I I still I feel bad for Wando to be honest with you. Like, yep. yeah, I just feel bad for him. This is it's got to be miserable to be honest with you. How can it not be for him? I just don't know how it could. Two be. goals scored, fourteen allowed, no wins, no points through four games. That's awful. And then add that on top of last year. I mean, he is in the latter stages here of his career on the brink of this amazing personal accomplishment, just having to kind of grind through. Something. And look, Quake, Quakes fans are getting after GM Jesse Fiorinelli, who, who constructed this roster, and they're right, too. He, he's, had a, he's had a few years now, um, and this team's just gotten worse and worse. All right. Ending the it. show on a high, guys. Hey! hey. I blame Kalen. <laughs> you got to see. All black? Yeah. yeah. Hey, You're things. wearing all black. You're wearing all black. Oh, Look at the color theme. I bring to this You're, show. Yeah, you got the Ray nice pink. Sunshine. It looks nice on you, man. All right, that's it. Thanks to Peter Vermees for joining us here ahead of uh, CCL Fever, and thank you to Pete Brownell, a.k.a. Box to Box, a.k.a. The Magic Man, a.k.a. Any other a.k.a.s for him? Uh, no, I don't think okay. so. Okay, thanks, Pete. Pete, PB, no regards. It, yep, hit him up. We'll see you on Thursday, everybody.